Hi, and welcome back to Psych with Mr. Snyder. Today, we get into a new chapter after a very quick last chapter eight about thinking, and we'll discuss intelligence and how it is measured. So here are your learning targets today. We'll talk about how intelligence is like a puzzle and what it is and our de uh, definition of it. We'll list and describe some of the leading theories of intelligence. And in section two, we will talk about the two most widely used intelligence tests, talk about what reliability and validity mean, and describe some controversies and problems associated with intelligence testing. So let's get started. Psychologists have come up with many different definitions of what intelligence is, and they can't all agree on it, but they agree on what intelligence is not, and they say it is not achievement. So achievement is the knowledge and skills gained from experience. Now, intelligence makes achievement possible by giving people the ability to learn, but intelligence are your abilities to learn from experience and also to think rationally and to deal effectively with others. So that is our textbook definition of intelligence. Some leading intelligence theories, Spearman was uh, one of the first people after the advent of psychology to put forth a psychological explanation of intelligence. And he says, there's two factors. There's the G factor, or your general intelligence, and that would be how you reason and solve problems. So if you took the SAT, that would be a reasonable um, uh, measurement of your G intelligence or your general intelligence. Your S factors, like music, sports, athleticism, whatever, creativity, arts, those are specific factors, and those are accounted for by your S factors. And that's Spearman's two-factor theory of intelligence. Thurston's uh, theory of primary mental abilities says that there are seven primary mental abilities. And you won't have to know what all of these are, but you'll just have to know that he thinks there are seven. But they are word fluency, verbal comprehension, spatial visualization, facility with numbers, memory, reasoning, and perceptual speed. Those are what make up a person's intelligence. The two others are gardeners. Gardner first started out with seven and then expanded it to nine types of intelligences that are independent of one another. They are your verbal or linguistic, your logical slash mathematical, visual, spatial, bodily, kinesthetic, musical or rhythmic, intrapersonal, interpersonal, naturalist and existential and those all have to do with how you um, basically relate with the world and the people in it and nine types of intelligences according to Gardner's theory and then Sternberg in the 80s puts forth the triarchic theory and he basically says that intelligence is comprised of three factors. You're analytical, you're creative, and you're practical. Analytical is like what we use in school, how we get through and read books and stuff. Creative intelligence is obviously how creative you are. And practical intelligence is, can be like if you, how you solve um, issues and how well you are working with people. So basically do you know what to do in specific situations to solve problems people use more than one factor at the same time they may also may favor one factor my wife um, can take a list of ingredients if i set ingredients out for her she'll make a meal out of it whereas i need a step by step by step list of what to do so my analytical intelligence is higher whereas her creative and practical intelligence is higher here is uh, some examples of analytical, creative, and practical intelligence. And then finally, we have emotional intelligence. And this was a theory that came about in the 90s, um, where basically, why do some people who don't seem intelligent succeed? And it's because they have emotional intelligence. Um, that are associated with success in school or on the job without having traditional um, feelings of intelligence. They are self-awareness or aware of your mood, 
mood management and able to um, kind of deflect an uncomfortable mood, self-motivation, impulse control, and people skills all make up your emotional intelligence. Let's move on to section two and the measurement of intelligence. And we'll talk about the two scales. The first is the one you're probably most familiar with, but you didn't know it was called, the Stanford Binet Scale. And this uh, first test was used in 1905 in France in order to kind of uh, identify which students in the French school system would need extra assistance in school. And it gave each score, each student a score called their mental age which shows the intellectual level at which a child is functioning. So if their chronological age is nine and they are functioning at a six-year-old's level and that's their mental age, then they would need extra assistance. This was brought to the United States and used at Stanford and after uh, 1916, it's known as the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale. And the version today spits out an intelligence quotient or your IQ, and that number reflects the relationship between your mental age and chronological age. It's actually mental age over chronological age uh, multiplied by 100 equals your IQ. And the IQ is an example of a transformed score or a score that we transform on purpose from a raw score in order to compare them. 100 would be the average age. If I am 29, that's my chronological age, and I perform at the level of a 29-year-old multiplied by 100. That would be 100, and that would be average for me. The Weschler scales are more widely used than the Stanford Binet scales because these actually have subtests, each measuring a different intellectual skill. So they have verbal uh, tests and performance tests. So it's not all measuring analytical intelligence and the official name is the revised Weschler adult intelligence scale and these scales do not give you a mental age but they do still use the term IQ and these scales measure both verbal and nonverbal abilities like I said before and what it does is it doesn't measure it with your mental age it takes your score and compares it to a person's answers with the answers of others in the same age group so how are you performing in relation to others in your age group. Here are some examples of questions or tasks on a Stanford Binet intelligence scale. Here are some typical subtests from the Weschler scales. Uh, you can see the verbal subtests on the top and the performance subtests on the bottom. Let's move on to reliability and validity. The reliability of a test is its consistency. Does it give you the same result every time? And one way to show this is called test and retest reliability, which is determined by comparing scores earned by the same person on the same test taken at different times. So if I gave you the unit five exam, um, it's kind of a poor example because it's measuring um, content, but if I gave you the Unit 5 exam three times on three different occasions, you should be able to get the same score uh, on each occasion. That would, test would have high test-retest reliability. And a test has validity if it measures what it is supposed to measure. We take test scores and compare them with outside standards or norms to determine test validity. And because of the nature of IQ tests, some psychologists believe it's um, difficult to make definitive statements about the validity of IQ tests. And we'll get into some of the problems here in a second. But for example, it is possible for a test to have incredible reliability and no validity. If I were to step on a scale and it were to say 150 pounds five different times, that test has incredible reliability but it has no validity because I do not weigh 150 pounds. I'm sorry to, sorry to say, I'm a little bit bigger than that. Controversies and problems. Um, in the early 1900s, we took some of these IQ tests and started limiting the number of immigrants that could enter the United States if, they, if their test scores were too low. And some states started to actually sterilize mentally defective people. And so the horrors of the Nazis in World War II brought an end to these practices. 
but still they were used here in the United States. Also, there is controversy saying that some of the tests are culturally biased and some tests give an advantage to a particular group of people because the test was made by members of that same group of people. So um, if there was a question on the tests about how to build an igloo, that would be very easy for somebody from up north or of the Inuit culture, but not from uh, Indiana or the United States even. And so that would test would be culturally biased. And also problems. A person's ec education, economic background, and even motivation on the day of the test can affect the results of intelligence tests. And there is something called stereotype threat as well. If a group is aware or unaware of a particular stereotype against them, um, they will do poorer on a test, especially if you tell them that stereotype beforehand, which is why I don't like to say the results of tests before um, I give it. Like, how'd the other periods do? Well, I don't want to tell you because that will affect your um, motivation and in going into the test. I don't want to stereotype you that this is a tough test. So let's review. We talked about the differences between achievement and intelligence. We discussed the four leading theories of intelligence and emotional intelligence. We talked about the Stanford Binet scales and the Weschler scales. Um, we talked about how a test has both reliability and validity and how they're different. And we discussed problems and controversies associated with intelligence tests. So later on, we'll, in this chapter, we'll discuss um, differences in intelligence and we'll also talk about how heredity influences intelligence. But I hope you learned something today. Fill out those learning targets and I'll see you later. Goodbye.